uh, where he got his doctoral degree at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on algebraic geometry, which is a branch of pure mathematics that has close ties to theoretical physics and actually string theory. So let's give him a big round of applause. Hello, everybody. So, I was, uh, I was sitting at dinner on Easter Sunday, actually, thinking, what should I do with my logic on talk about? And I thought, well, you know, last year I did something that was pretty close to what I actually work on, which was logic and geometry, for those who saw it. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sitting there and I was thinking, well, what do people want to know? So I thought, well, if I meet somebody at the pub, and I talk to them, and they say, well, what do you do for your living? And I say, I'm a pure mathematician. And then I think, what questions do they have? And invariably, the question they always ask is, what on earth is it you actually do? Uh, and the second question they always ask is, is that just doing really hard sums? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, I mean, there are mathematicians who do really hard sums. And there are mathematicians who build mathematical models, and if you watch Stephanie Barsby's talk, you know, all of those wonderful meteorological models that she's talking about, there's some pretty hardcore mathematical calculations underneath that. That's not really what the pure mathematicians are doing. There's, there's other people who do those kinds of things. So, what are the pure mathematicians doing? Well, that's what I'd like to tell you. But, you know, that's a really big question. It's, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot in that question. So I thought, well, I'll simplify this down a bit. What I'm going to do is I'll take an example. So I'm going to take an area of pure mathematics that many of you probably don't know very much about. And I'm going to sort of build it up right from the ground. And we'll see how the subject actually works, how the theory is developed. And hopefully this will sort of show you by example how pure mathematics work and what pure mathematicians are doing with their time. So, okay, so the first thing that you do is you say, okay, somebody, generally somebody much smarter than me, comes up with some sort of idea. And they sit down and they say, we can use, pure, we can use mathematics to study some kind of object. And I'm being deliberately vague about what I mean by object, but in this particular case, we're going to say, we're going to study nuts. So nuts show up all over the place, you know, shoelaces, other places. Um, <laughs> maybe we can use pure mathematics to study, to study knots, and uh, we'll be more precise about what we mean by this as we go on. But, so. The second step you do once you've had your idea is you say, okay, we've got to define these things properly. You know, just saying a knot is something in your shoelaces, well, yeah, I mean, what exactly is a knot, you know? Say, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, okay, I mean, you know, what exactly is a knot? Let's try and make this concrete in a mathematical sense. Let's try and make a mathematical sense of this idea. So, when we all think of a knot intuitively in our heads, I mean, what we think of is something that you tie in a piece of string. So here is a picture of a knot that somebody has tied. I don't know how they managed to tie it because the piece of string has no ends. But uh, this is a picture of a knot that somebody has made. But unfortunately, mathematically, this isn't much good for us. I mean, you know, we can't really take any mathematical content out of the statement, it's something you tie in a piece of string. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this idea and we're going to abstract it into some sort of mathematical definition. That's our first step. So what we're going to do is instead of studying knots as things we tie in a piece of string, we're going to actually study objects that we call knot diagrams. And a knot diagram is a plane curve that's allowed to cross over itself. So here's a knot diagram from the knot we saw before. And as you can see, I mean, this is some sort of, I mean, I'm not really going to define a plane curve, that's kind of a complicated definition, but this is some sort of curve that I've drawn on the screen, and the special thing about this curve is, is bits of it are allowed to go over the tops of other bits of it. So, I've drawn myself this knot diagram, and I'm going to have a little bit of extra definition coming in here. I've circled these three little red points, and I'm calling these crossings. And this is going to be uh, this is going to be important as we go on. So, okay, so I've got my definition mathematically. I want to study these knot diagrams, and I've got sort of a very solid conception of what these things are. You know, I've got a very concrete idea, but you know, somehow. We really, these things, we should also, you know, we should constrain ourselves a bit. We should, we should have some rules that these can satisfy. So generally, I mean, this is still part of the definition, the abstraction, but we're going to, uh, we're going to constrain the possible not diagrams we can have by making them satisfy certain rules. So the first rule that we're going to have is that 
if I've got, you know, my curve in my dot diagram, it's got to be a closed loop. I'm not allowed to have edits. And uh, so, you know, I can't have this bit on the end where it's sort of hanging over. Because the problem with this is sort of, you know, from a mathematical standpoint, if I just have this, then it can just fall apart. And so if I have something with ends, then I can just sort of pull away there and just disintegrate into an empty bit of string. So, you know, really this is, this is not much good. I want my, my loop of string to be completely closed up so I can pull and push it and do whatever I like and it doesn't undo my knot. It still remains knotted. So this thing, this thing is not that. Okay, now, the second thing we're not allowing is we're not allowing ourselves to have multiple pieces of string. So here I've got a knot which is, well technically this is not a knot, it's sort of a link, but we've got this object and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's made up of two pieces of string. And there's an entirely separate theory concerning these things and, you know, I mean, it sort of falls broadly under the banner of knot theory, but we're not so interested in that for, for now, so we're going to ignore the case where we've got more than one curve as well. Um, and finally, I say that we're having curves that have crossings, but I don't like this idea of having three, three branches of the curve all crossing over at the same point. And the reason I don't like this is because it doesn't allow me to see what's going on behind this one strand. Of the three strands I've got here, I have no idea which one was at the back. So really, you know, this could be two different things going on. One of those, you know, either those, one of those two strands at the back has to be in front, and one has to be behind. But I have no idea which one is happening. So I don't like the diagrams that have these triple crossings. Those are, those are not very good. So what do I do? Well, if I've got something with a triple crossing, then all I do is I sort of take my strand at the top and I just drag it down a bit to get it out of the way, so I can see what's happening underneath. So I can get rid of that, and I can just sort of pull this top strand down and leave it just sitting over, sitting over towards the bottom. And then, I mean, now it's completely unambiguous what's going on. I can see which of these curves are on the top and which curve is, is underneath. Okay, so that's my definition. I'm saying, you know, we're going to study these knot diagrams, and knot diagrams have to satisfy these three rules. And that's pretty much all there is to it. That's, that's all we... Uh, that's, that's all we've got for our, for our definition. Now, okay, so, once we've taken our, well, you know, once we've got our mathematical theory, we've, we've got our idea, we've sat down and we've said, okay, we've taken our idea and we've defined the concept rigorously and mathematically, then what's the third step? Well, the third step is deciding when we're going to agree that two objects are the same. So, in the question of knots, uh, what we're really asking here is whether two knot diagrams are representing the same knot. In the sense that we think of a knot as you know, some sort of thing tied to a piece of string, if I lay that flat down on the table and draw a diagram of it, it kind of there's a dependence there on like how I, how I put it down on the table. If I, if I move it around, it might change. So I really want to sort of take this out by considering knot different knot diagrams would be the same. And this is the idea of equivalence. So, so effectively, what we really want to do here is we want to think of two knot diagrams as being the same or equivalent if we can move between them without breaking the piece of string that they're made of. So I've got a few knot diagrams here which are all the same. All of these three things are equivalent. So if I take the top one, then I can take this sort of top branch that looks a bit like a smiley face and I can just slide it off of the top there and make it into an open circle. And in the second one, I've got this kind of figure of eight shape, but all I can do is I can take one of the ends and I can just twist it. And that just opens up and gives me, gives me an open circle again. So, we think of knot diagrams as being equivalent if we can move between them without doing anything that actually breaks our piece of string. And we can, you know, again, this, this definition is not particularly good from a mathematical standpoint, it's not very precise. So, uh, a guy in the 1800s, I think, called Ryan Meister came along, and he said, well, two knots are the same if and only if you can move between them using a certain sequence of operations. So there are three operations you're allowed to do. The first one is you can remove all the three twists. So this is, if I have something that looks like this thing on the left, then I can, uh, I can just sort of take the top part of this and give it a half twist and end up with an open, an open loop. 
And so these two things are recorded. There's, there's, from the perspective of not theory, there's no difference between these two things. It's, they're both the same and not. I mean, it's just, we just don't twist it. And we can also switch between the following things. We can take, if I have two branches that cross over the top of each other, then I can just take the one that's on top here and I can just slide it away. So then I end up with two branches that are just completely separate. And similarly, if I have two branches that are separate, I can just slide the one back over the top of the other. Uh, and finally, if I have something like this bottom one, I mean, I guess, like an upside down picnic table, uh, then I can just take this top strand going well. I can take the strand going across the bottom of the diagram that is nonetheless on the top in terms of the strands. And I can slide it up past this crossing and have it on the other side. So, all of these things are allowed, and this is what we mean by the idea of equivalence. So, yeah, two knot diagrams are equivalent if and only if we can move between them using these, using these operators. Okay, now we really get into the mix. So, you know, everything so far has really been the preparation. And what pure mathematicians are really after doing is classifying. So, we've sat down, you know, we've said we're going to study knots, we've decided what a knot is, and then we've decided also that, you know, what we, what we mean by two knot diagrams or two knots being the same thing. And now the question is, can we make a list of all possible knots? Because somehow if we can do this, then we know all of their possible properties. We can sit there and if you say to me, hey, I've got this random knot, and you give it to me, and I can sit down and I can look at it and I can say, ah, oh, yes, this is the case 257 in my table. And I look it up in my table, and my table will theoretically tell me everything I could possibly want to know. So this is somehow like the end game. This is what I want. I want a sort of a complete description of everything I could want to know about everything that fits into my, my sort of, uh, my scheme of definition, I suppose. Um, so, the big question in knot theory is, can we make a list of all possible knot diagrams up to the idea of two of them being equivalent? So, you know, let's start off, I mean, the first thing you do if somebody says, can you make a list of everything, well, you just say, well, let's just sit down with a sheet of paper and start writing them down. Uh, so, you know, let's have a go at that. This is this is the naive. The fact I've called it the naive approach probably means it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, so let's start off with no crossings at all, but if we've got no crossings at all in our knot, then we've just got an open an open loop. And this is the only possible thing we can have. There's no way we can get anything that doesn't that have, doesn't have any crossings that's not just that. There's only one knot diagram with no crossings, and we call it the unknot. <laughs> uh, that's not my that's not my name for it, that's like the official name for it. So much whoever was watching the physics talks earlier, that position to uh, physicists, you know, the guy said physicists aren't terribly imagined for their names, the problem is that that position is candy. Uh, but sometimes they like some guy has some abstract picture in his head of what some really, really complicated object looks like to him, and then he'll name it something like a ship. Because he thinks it looks like a bundle of wheat. And he's just like, where did you get that from? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway. Anyway, so, uh, okay, that's no crossing taken out of the way. So if we've got one crossing, and if you've got a loop of string and you draw a picture of it, it's only got one crossing, it's fairly easy to see that's basically the only thing that can happen. Uh, but as we saw earlier, if I've got this thing, then what can I do? Well, I can just untwist this. I can take one end and I can just flip it over. And then I get back to where I was on the last slide, I get unlocked again. So, really what I'm saying is that there are no, there's nothing new when I go to one crossing. The unlock, the unlock has no crossings. If I go to one crossing, I don't get any new knots. Everything is back exactly as what we had before. So, there's, there's nothing new with only one crossing, I guess is the moral of this slide. Uh, okay, let's try two crossings. So this time I've got two possibilities depending on which way the crossings go. So on the top one I've got like over and under and in under and over, and on the other one I've got both going the same way. And again, I mean, if I look at this, if I take the top one, then I can just sort of twist each end of them. And if I've got the bottom one, I can take this sort of smiley face bit and just slide it off. And really what I'm getting here is just again two more copies of the other one. So this is 
know, there's, there's two new guys, there's two guys out of two crossings, but they're both equivalent to the other one. So again, we're getting nothing new. And, you know, you're saying, this talk is really big and tedious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what he's doing is showing bits and things that are equivalent to the other one. And that's kind of, that's kind of rough. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing really interesting happening with one or two crossings. But three is where stuff starts to get fun. So in three crossings, we've got a knot that looks like this. Uh, and this is, uh, this is new, this is not, you can twist and bend and deform this as much as you like and you're not possibly ever going to get back to the other knot. And uh, this is, this is, so this is genuinely new and it's, it's a knot called the trefoil. And this was the knot that I showed you right at the start. And this is, uh, it's the simplest knot diagram that's not equivalent to the other knot. So it has, uh, yeah, it has three crossings. It's, it's the simplest knot there is. Um, and you can show that if you've got three crossings, everything is everything with three crossings is either a trefoil or the other one. Yeah, so this is really with three crossings, this is really all there is. Uh, okay, four crossings is the last one I'm going to do. Uh, with four crossings, we've got this knot, and this is another new one. This is not the trefoil, and uh, this is called the figure eight knot. And so, you know, if I've got something with four crossings, then either I can switch it around or get, and get an knot or a trefoil, or it's one of these, a figure eight knot. Okay, now we get to the issue. If we keep going with this, this is going to get really hard. And I've got a picture here which is quite low resolution. This is knots up to seven crossings. So we start off with the other knot, and then we've got this three one, that's the trefoil, four one, that's the figure eight knot. And we've got three new, or two new ones with five crossings, and three new ones with six crossings. Seven crossings, we've got seven. With eight crossings, if, I, if memory serves, there's 20, 21 or 26 or something like that. With nine crossings, there's like a few hundred. With ten crossings, there's a few more hundred. It, it really gets pretty bad pretty fast. So we're going to need to be more cunning. Well, before we can get more cunning, then we should really figure out what exactly our problem is. And the problem that we've got is not listing all the possibilities. You know, I can write, well, I can't personally, but clever computer people can, uh, can write a computer program that will just print out a list of all possible knots with, say, 20 crossings. And they can just, you know, write a program and it will just give me all the possibilities, but a huge sheet of probably many sheets of paper. Uh, the problem is not getting a list of the possibilities, but figuring out which ones are equivalent. Because we want to discard things that are equivalent to each other. We only want one from each type. Uh, oh dear, you. You didn't read that. <laughs> so here are two knot diagrams. And this is a very famous, these are two very famous knot diagrams, they're called the Perco pair. Uh, they've got ten crossings each. And in early classifications of knots from the 19th century, these ones were always shown as, uh, as separate, separate, not equivalent to each other. And it took a horrendous amount of time, in fact 90 years, uh, for some guy, I can't remember who it was who actually showed it, I don't know, it could have been Perko, that's why they're made up. Someone from Perko came along eventually after 90 years and showed that these two are actually the same. So this is, this is really non-trivial. It's really hard to tell if these two diagrams are actually the same knot or not. I, I was trying to work that into the title of this talk, but I couldn't, I couldn't find a way to make a really bad knot or not. Uh, okay. So how are we going to... If I've got two knot diagrams, I want to know if they're equivalent. So how are they going to do it? And one way of doing this is using the thing with variance. And this is a great tool in the Bureau of Mathematics Arsenal. If you're trying to classify anything, the first, well, after you find a naive approach of listing them, which almost invariably fails, the first thing you try and do is computing things called invariants. Now, what's an invariant? Well, a, a not invariant is a property you can associate to a knot diagram. So, you know, if I've got a knot diagram, then I can compute knot invariants for it. And generally, there'll be, yeah, there's some sort of property that it has. And the important thing that these features have, which is why these, these properties have, which is why they're called invariants, is that if I have two knot diagrams that are equivalent to each other, if I've got two knot diagrams that are equivalent to each other, they've got to have the same invariants. So this means that I can tell knot diagrams apart. If I've got two knot diagrams that have different invariants, they can't possibly be equivalent. They must be different in my classification. 
This enables me to divide things up, to start dividing things up into boxes, I guess. Um, the only problem with this approach is that sometimes you can have inequivalent things that have the same invariants. So, invariants enable us to tell long diagrams apart, but they can't necessarily help us tell if two things are the same. You know, we could, we could sort of, uh, I can't think of a good analogy. I mean, you know, an inverter, uh, no, I can't think of a good analogy. <laughs> I mean, we could, you know, we could sort everyone in the room uniquely into boxes based upon whether they're male or female. But that wouldn't, you know, that would help us tell two people apart, but it wouldn't help us tell if two people are the same. Uh, okay. So what's an example? I mean, I told you these non invariants. Let me give you an example of one. A simple example of a non invariant is what's called tricolorability. So the knot diagram has the property of tricolorability if it satisfies, if you can colour it in using the following rules. If I colour it in, I'll show you what I mean in a second. Firstly, you're only, I mean, the tri part of this, you're allowed to use precisely three parts. And secondly, if I have three branches of the knot which meet at a crossing, then they're either all going to be the same colour or they're all going to be different colours. So here is the tri colouring of the thread oil. I've used three colours to colour this thing in, and every time I have one of these crossings here, I'll use this thing, every time I have one of these crossings, I have three different colours meeting there. So this is what it means for a knot to be tri colour. Okay, now, so that's, you know, that little picture shows us that the thread oil could be is tri colourable. Let's see what happens if we try and do the same thing with a figure of eight knot. Well, I can bring up a picture. If I try and do the figure of eight knot, you know, I just start somewhere and go around and start colouring bits in. And uh, I'll leave it to you to go home and verify. It doesn't really matter how you try and do this. You always end up with some branch that you can't colour in. You know, I can't colour this branch green because it comes to this crossing and all the branches, have, all the branches of this crossing have to be different colours. I can't colour it red because if it comes here, it can't, you know, it can't. They all have to be different colours there, they all have to be different colours at the bottom. So. It doesn't matter how I try it, I always get one branch that doesn't work. So what does this show? This is showing us that the thread oil and the figure eight are not the same. They can't possibly be the same because the thread oil can be coloured with three colours and the figure of eight can't. So because you know it works for one, it doesn't work for other, and this is a not invariant, then it shows they have to be different. They can't possibly be equivalent to each other. Okay. Okay, so this is sort of um, this is the sort of point for, this is the, uh, this is the end of my sort of theoretical bit. This is usually the way it goes historically as well, you know, somewhere along the line a few mathematician will say, well hey, you know, knots are kind of interesting, let's just sit down and try and classify them. And then, you know, 50 years later someone comes along and says, hey, you know, this could be useful. Um, so, well what's the point of all of this? And uh, I'm going to show you some places that not surprise in nature. And, uh, this is sort of where the tools of knot theory can be called in. So the first one is molecular knots. So effectively what this means is that you can have two you can have chemical you can have chemicals which have structures which can be linked together effectively. So I'm not really a chemist, so I don't know the words to describe this. Um, I mean effectively what we've got here is we've got two molecules. So we've got a molecule around on the left. Oh no, actually, no, there's only one molecule. Okay. This is a thread oil. Okay, this is a molecule which is like bundled up in a thread oil shape. And the point is the chemist can sit there, but the fact that this molecule is in a, a nice tiny little knot actually affects its chemical properties. So, you know, chemists can sit there and say, well, you know, what shapes could my molecules be knotted into and how will that affect their properties? And of course, for this, we really need an understanding of what possible knot shapes there are in the first place. Um, a very similarly related thing is DNA folding itself. So DNA is actually surprisingly long. Uh, and you know, it's all going to be bundled up very tightly to fit into your cells. And it's these sort of long strands of stuff. And so there are actually enzymes in your cell that will take your DNA and sort of coil it up into a little knot for storage purposes. And there are other enzymes that when you want to get the DNA out and copy the cell, it'll just It'll just take the, uh, it'll take this knot and it'll just sort of untangle it a little bit at a time and copy it and then put it back together again. So 
you know, there's questions of what sort of knots can, what sort of knots can this happen for? How do these enzymes actually take these knots and sort of partially undo them and then redo them up again? And again, this is all questions of knot theory. So, um, a few more things. <coughs> fluid, di fluid dynamics of sternal liquids. So, if I, it's not a bit difficult to describe, but if I take like a stick and put it in, the best thing to do, well, okay, I mean, it looks like this. <laughs> if you take a couple of dyes and put them in a, put them in a uh, like a beaker, and stir it around, then the dyes sort of spread out into these long filaments, and the filaments spin around and tie themselves into knots. And you can actually produce mathematical models of these things by studying sort of you imagine the you imagine that your your dye is sort of a piece of string, and that your stirring implement is just sort of taking the piece of string and grabbing the loop of it and then sort of twisting it round and round and round. And again, not theory can tell you that if you take a sort of piece of string and do this sort of twisting, the shapes of the knots it can tie itself into. And this, uh, and this sort of determines or partially determines the, uh, the dynamics of the liquid as to be external. Um, very similarly, the structure of the sun's corona, which is, I mean, that's really more fluid dynamics, to be honest. It's, uh, I think the technical term is solar magnetohydrodynamics, which I just wanted to get in there because it's a cool sounding word. <laughs> And also, I mean, there's lots of other stuff in pure mathematics which, uh, where this comes up. So there's, uh, there's applications to things like singularity theory and differential topology and group theory and such like. So what we've got here is a picture of a, uh, is a picture, this is actually not a knot, this is a link made of three, three rings. There's a ring there, a ring there, a ring there. There's a thing called the Borromean link. And you can sort of take this, you can take a knot or a link and you can sort of smooth it off into a surface with this sort of white blue thing. And uh, these surfaces actually have a lot of very interesting properties. They depend upon the knot that you they're, they're sort of their properties are determined by the knot that you start with. So you can get a lot of the mathematical properties by, by sort of studying these boundary knots. Uh, and finally, which probably should have been the first point, uh, we do it because it's kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> who, who really cares if it feels cancer? Like it's <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I think that's about it. Got a couple of questions. Hello. Uh, this last one looks like the kind of thing you'd get if you had a plane and stuck it into a solution. That, yeah, uh, yeah. This, this is very much how the sort of how these surfaces are constructed. This is uh, it's a soap film. Yeah, yeah. The soap film surfaces. I mean, soap film surfaces are an example of uh, what's called minimal surfaces in um, in differential geometry, and they have they have a lot of very interesting properties because they sort of they have this sort of tension which acts to minimise the uh, acts to minimise the surface area. So. These, yeah, these sort of minimal surfaces with knot boundaries actually have a lot of interesting properties. And I mean, the area that I know about is um, you can use this for, for singularity. You, you can use this to study singularity, sort of points where points where sort of uh, surfaces and objects are sort of folded off in on each other. And, uh, and somehow these, there's a close relationship between these and knots. It's, uh, it's very, yeah, it's quite interesting. Question. If you can find a military application, wouldn't you get a lot more funding? Quite <laughs> 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 possibly. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know how to break it, it's not really a lot here, but our, uh, our, little, our little trick in our box is always to, um, you sort of, you take your paper, which is very nice and pure mathematical, and then right at the end you just sort of bungle over stuff in the introduction saying about how all this links to physics, and then people see the word like string theory and stuff in there, and they're like, oh, string theory! Give them all the money. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> if they say, you know, I'm, I'm looking to study, uh, you know, I'm looking to study uh, the construction of collabi owl shapes, and they're like, what? Well, I don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, but I don't think there's any military applications of not theory. I think it's fairly honest. <laughs> <laughs> Theory to be correct. 
And furthermore, for like, I mean, for those of you who know things about string theory, um, it postulates the existence of extra dimensions. And the extra dimensions that are postulated are the reason that they say that you can't see them is because they're curled up in these little tiny balls. And, um, well, not exactly balls. They're, they're sort of curled up into these little tiny shapes. And, uh, you know, sort of the leading theories of string theory say that these shapes are collabi manifolds. And, you know, I study collabi manifolds, and this is what we put in the abstracts of our papers. But, you know, if I wanted something to work out, I want, like, string theory to turn out to be true, and furthermore, the collabi shape that turns out to be the one in our universe to be one that I construct. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really cool. <laughs> Why the application 